and welcome to School of Hustle. I'm your host, Sarah, and this is a show where we chat with everyday entrepreneurs about everything it takes to build the business of your dreams. Small business lies at the heart of our country, and there are 27 million people that own and operate their own business. And our next guest is no exception. He is a serial entrepreneur with a mind for business and an eye for trends, and he has built four different businesses in a variety of industries. Jeff Esquio is a self-made entrepreneur, and he has appeared in Forbes Inside Edition and has even done a TED Talk. Very impressive. His journey started with CryoCentral, a recovery center to help decrease inflammation, increase metabolic rate, and so much more. And of course, his second business, Soul Fresh, is a shoe restoration company. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You know, me and you have been friends for a while. We went to grad school together, so I feel like we go way back. We know what it was like when we didn't have any businesses, and now you have four of them. It's so impressive. Could you tell me about why you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been some time since the Baruch Bearcat days. Well, it's been like four or five years now. Uh, so yeah, a lot has changed. Uh, definitely decided to kind of take the leap of faith that I think most entrepreneurs do and uh, do it full time. So I'm happy to have done it. And it's nothing been uh, nothing but a great learning experience and it's so fun thus, thus far. Yeah, it definitely is an experience. And once you accomplish what you've accomplished, it's really fulfilling. Now, back at Baruch, um, uh, is that where you got your idea from? I think you took some entrepreneurship classes. Yeah, so when I was going to Baruch, I was kind of in a weird place career-wise because I wasn't sure if I wanted to stay in the industry that I was in, which was mainly sustainability uh, for corporate hotels. And um, luckily, they were uh, able to cover some of my grad school degree, so I decided to pursue my MBA. And while I was doing my MBA, I took an entrepreneurship class, and that's kind of where I got exposed to the whole idea of owning a business. So that's kind of how Cryo Central, the first business uh, I had with my business partner, Danny, came together. Can you tell us first a little bit about Cryo Central? Sure, absolutely. So Cryo Central is a cryotherapy and muscle recovery pain management center. So we do uh, services that include cryotherapy. So what it is, is it uses extreme cold to kind of get a response from your body that you're kind of looking for. So I was really big into the fitness world um, and I was doing powerlifting and I noticed this was a big thing on the West Coast um, and hadn't really made its way to the East Coast in 2015. So I thought there was a pretty big opportunity. And what cryotherapy really is, it's just you're in this cold chamber for about two to three minutes. Yeah, it feels like five hours, though. I've done it before. I was like, this is the most my body has ever felt in my life. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's kind of a shock to your body, but that's a response. That but you, you feel amazing after. That's what shocked me the most. Absolutely. So a lot of people who come to us, they have inflammation issues, um, joint pain, arthritis, um, you name it. So we have, uh, we run a full gamut of people who are athletes trying to look for an edge in their recovery or just people dealing with aches and pains that they can't find relief anywhere else. Now, you mentioned California in that. Um, why watch California? I think California is a, a great hub in the U.S. for trends that are going on. A lot of what I see that happens in the West Coast tends to wake its way to the East Coast over time. Um, so cryotherapy was just one of those things. In 2015, there were a few on every corner, and they were starting to pop up fairly steadily. Um, whereas in, in the California, East, they were a few on every corner or was there some here too at that point? California and Texas, mainly there was a, there was, there was a big, um, there was a big market for it in both those areas. And then Jersey, New York, there were maybe three to five facilities at the time. And now it's jumped up to maybe 30, 40. So wow. I think, um, yeah, I think we got in at the right time and, uh, it looks like it's becoming more and more well-known in the industry. I think catching trends is a real skill set. Do you have any advice on how how other people can catch trends early that actually will be beneficial long term, not just like those trends that last six months and then go away? Yeah, I mean, it's just an understanding of, I guess, the market that you're looking for trends in. So for Cryo Central, I think about fitness and uh, how people are always more passionate and there and there's a steady increase of people being more aware of their health. So I knew this was a good niche, a good market to go into because I only see people caring about their health growing more and more. 
uh, for Soul Fresh. That is a sneaker cleaning and restoration business. And I've always grown around um, Jersey City, which is a population here, uh, a town here in Jersey that had a big sneaker, uh, what they call sneakerhead population, people who are really into uh, urban fashion, urban streetwear. And that was only growing. And that's very popular around the U.S. So I just started to think about the future of these kinds of industries and is it a good opportunity for the service that we're trying to provide? Yeah, it really is brilliant because you have all these people collecting sneakers and they are willing to invest thousands and thousands of dollars. I mean, I went to I went into a sneaker store um, last year and they had a pair of collectible sneakers. It was $50,000 for this pair of sneakers. So you know people are willing to invest in it. So it's brilliant, you know? People invest in the sneaker, they wanna take care of it and your business does that. It's a big branding play. A lot of the sneakers that are out there that are most coveted are, there is not many of them. So a lot of people in this industry they wear them because they love them. They have a passion for them. And also because of the resale market, a lot of times people will buy shoes for a retail price and go to the resale market and sell it for two, three, four times. So a lot of people involved in sneakers look at it as their version of the stock market. So what was the first thing you did uh, after you came up with the idea for Soul Fresh and Cryo Central? Why don't we start with Cryo Central since that was your first business? Sure. So Cryo Central was a bare bones. I've never been an entrepreneur. I was strictly a corporate America type of worker where I was had a nine to five and I didn't know anything about it. So I literally Googled how to start your own business. <laughs> and that's pretty much how my That's pretty much how we all start, isn't it? It's like yeah, Google's it's our best that, friend. <laughs> absolutely. It's so funny how people don't think like it's as easy as that, but it was... I wouldn't yeah. say easy, but it was it's not easy, but it's you have not, to do a lot of research on your, your own. Absolutely. With the emergence of like YouTube, Google, and there's so much online learning you could do. That's literally how we started the foundation. We looked up how to start a business, how to start a cryotherapy business, how to open your own store and just kept the ball rolling from there. I imagine there's a lot of investment that goes into cryotherapy. You have to buy all the equipment. How did you deal with funding for that? That's a major hurdle for a lot of entrepreneurs starting out and a big risk a risk factor too. A lot of people are really wary about putting their savings on the line, taking loans out. Um, but luckily for me, I had uh, about seven years in uh, the corporate world. So I had a, a bunch of savings saved up. Uh, my business partner, Daniel Pozo, he actually... Um, 150 50 on it with me and he also had the same so we had a good foundation of cash to get started wow. and along the way um as a business and as you grow and as you scale sometimes you do have to take loans that will help you uh grow so now you have three locations with cryo central you have uh one location with soul fresh but i believe you're expanding to a larger location so we we recently just expanded uh, so to talk a little bit about their history um Soulfresh actually started as a pickup delivery company. So just as a way to kind of test the market because there's not many places that'll clean and restore your shoes for you. So I wasn't sure how solid of an idea it could be. So we just started locally just doing pickup and delivery, eventually made our way to a small 400 square foot storefront. And then one year later, um, which was this past year, uh, we moved into a much bigger store so we can offer more retail. Uh, take in more uh, orders and uh, just be more efficient. Well, I'm glad it's all working out really well. Now, a lot of entrepreneurs, it, there's a moment where they're working a full-time job and they have this business idea. Maybe they've already started the business. And the question is, when do you quit the full-time job to do your business full-time? And sometimes you're doing both at once. Often you are. Can you talk about that journey for you? With With my experience, uh, most people always say, if you're going to commit to something, do it 100% and do it full time. Where I kind of took a, a less risky approach that I thought was keeping my full time job and employing people to run the day to day for Cryo, which is Cryo Central, which is the first business. So, what we did was I kept the full time job. My partner and I both did. We hired people who would manage the store on the day to day. And we just managed everything right through our phones. We put systems in place to make it really easy on them. And we just communicated regularly via text and emails and just grew the business that way. And then it wasn't until I started to notice the business was starting to move upwards. We were opening up the second location and we needed uh, more help uh, on that level. So that's when I decided to make the jump. 
and I try, I looked at the income and made sure that I would be able to maintain my livelihood without the support of my full-time job. And that was the perfect opportunity. Could you briefly just mention your, your two other businesses? I know we're not going to get too much into those because you have so many businesses, which is incredible, but they are in different industries, which I think is brilliant, especially today because with the whole COVID situation, you do have certain industries that are knocked out. For example, tourism's knocked out. But by diversifying your industries, you've really been able to maintain success. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, with uh, so the other two businesses that I am a part of, um, one of them is Energy Now. Uh, Energy Now is more of a B2B business, which works mostly with other businesses, uh, whereas Soul Fresh and Cryo works with retail customers like you and I. So with Energy Now, we worked uh, we worked with hotels, commercial buildings, and matching them with uh, energy suppliers locally. That'll give them the best rate. So just by knocking off one or two cents off their energy bill, they're saving tens of thousands of dollars that they could put towards energy efficiency projects and things that are more sustainable. And that kind of ties back to what I did in my career when I was um, uh, working at Corporate America, which was helping hotels be more energy efficient. So that's really the only business that you had actual work experience in before going into it, it seems. Yes. That's so bold of you to choose businesses to start with that you technically had no work experience. And I, I respect that so much. I, yeah, I mean, I think for me, my, like a lot of people are like, what's your core competency, competency, what's your skill? I think for me, it's really just being able to build process. This is the fourth business is actually, like you mentioned, an entirely different industry, which is uh, childcare. Um, so what we did with our team was we bought out a daycare that was looking to exit the industry, upgraded some things, added a couple of things that we believe would be essential for a Montessori. So a Montessori is more an advanced style of learning for uh, toddlers and up. So we take kids six months and older and put them through uh, more of a robust uh, education system, whereas a daycare is more of we watch a child and that's it. So I've kind of grown that as well as the other three businesses by just recreating the wheel. I feel like if you know how to market, which is number one, know how to build process, which is number two, that's essentially the two main pillars that you need to grow any business, how to get customers and how to keep them going and keep it growing. So with that, I've been able to go to, into different industries, just putting that blueprint in place in place and building around it based on what the industry needs. Your blueprint idea is so brilliant. Can you please write a book about this or an article? Because I think a lot of people would just really appreciate it. To summarize the blueprint idea, just so I'm clear, the first step is marketing, marketing your business, correct? Like for, for most of the businesses, I did a survey. So I want to understand how big is the demand. So if it's big enough that, and if I market correctly, will it be profitable? then that's kind of where I start to explore it. So yeah, marketing is definitely important in the very early, early stages because you have to understand, is there enough of a market out there? to be So successful? it's understanding the market. Is there a demand in the market for the product is step one. And then step two would be building the product? Yeah, I mean, build, once you know there's a demand out there, now you have to try to figure out how to get them in. So it's all about branding. You're building not only a business, but you're building a brand. People want to, be able to come to yours versus any other competitor. And why is that? So you have to create that why. So you have to create a value proposition that makes you superior to other competitors. Yep. And then what's step three of that? Getting a well, funding maybe? Well, execution. And now you have to create this process where it's kind of running on its own it's getting more customers in the door and it's keeping the customers that you have. So once you put that machine together of all three steps, now it's a matter of refining it, improving it, and growing it. And when you say refining, improving it, what ways do you use to determine how do you improve it? Do you take customer feedback, adapt, and then move forward? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, customer feedback is really important to us. Um, luckily for us, we have uh, nothing but five-star reviews across the board for, for all the businesses because customer service is uh, very important to me. And being in the hospitality background, I understand the important importance of customer experience. So I'm constantly listening to feedback, what they think will improve uh, their experience at any of our locations, 
Um, maybe it's a matter of pricing. Maybe it's a matter of, of value that we have in our service. So it's just being open to feedback, good and bad, and and putting together something that your customers will appreciate. And then just repeating that process for other businesses. And that's pretty much the blueprint that you've been using that has worked. Google, YouTube, learn, 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 fire away. You have the four different businesses in different industries. Was that strategic or did that just kind of happen naturally? No, it just happened naturally. I mean, uh, opportunities came along and it just looked, it just a way for me to hedge my risk as well. Um, being playing in different industries, seeing how things unfold. Uh, but yeah, a lot of like the, the soul fresh business, um, my business partner, Steve, Mike and Justin, and they're big in the sneaker industry and they had familiarity with it. So I knew, Hey, let's do it. This is a good opportunity for this. And that's when it kind of grew, uh, the energy business. I had colleagues from, um, my old employer and then we kind of came together and that's kind of how that started. And then also with uh, the daycare, that's actually my family members who presented it to me, thought it was a great opportunity. And now um, they are running the day to day there. So it's just opportunity presented itself, being able to understand what I can handle and just uh, going with the flow, especially with a great team. Yeah. So how do you determine between an opportunity and something that most likely won't work out? I'm sure people have approached you with other business ideas and maybe you've passed on those. How do you make that decision? So for me now, I mean, I, I am stretched pretty thin. Yeah, so so you have a lot pick, going on. <laughs> yeah, definitely trying to pick my battles. So I definitely get a few uh, proposals here and there and just the people pitching their idea just to see what I think, not necessarily bring me in, but just to hear what they think. But for me, it's just a matter of knowing, being being cognizant of the numbers, understanding what are the hurdles that are going to be within that particular business. and then thinking if it has the growth potential to put in the amount of work. So when because, you say the numbers, what numbers are you looking at? So a, a big indicator that a lot of people follow is profit margin. Uh, are you selling more and making enough revenue after costs pretty much? Yeah. Uh, so for what me- What if they haven't started selling yet, but they have an idea? Uh, so it's just forecasting, seeing what industries are out there, getting a sense of their numbers, understanding what, if you can recreate something, maybe a percentage of that, what would the numbers look like to you on a local level? If you're a local business or if you're a national level, how do you get to that level uh, without spending too much up front? So it's just like you definitely have to understand the language of accounting and have a basic understanding of the language of finance because accounting tells the past, finance tells the future. So knowing both together, it kind of understands how to run your business. Um, talk about your social presence for your businesses. How do you, what tactics do you use? Do you find that social media brings in a lot of business for you? I mean, for me, uh, we do a lot of Instagram, Facebook ads, Google ads, um, you name it. Uh, we got a lot of traction through that. Um, doing re- referrals type of deals where if a customer brings in another customer, they'll get us some kind of special. So I believe in like creating some kind of community, creating some kind of a business where people want to bring more business to your business. That's a great idea. How do you incentivize people to uh, bring in new customers? So discounts are always good. A lot of people love getting a discount on a membership if they bring in somebody on their membership for cryo, for example. Um, If you shop at a local store in Jersey City, uh, maybe we'll give you a discount for Soul Fresh. So it's just about creating synergy with other businesses in the area or creating an incentive for them to want to help your business. How do you do that? Do you just go business to business and talk to them and find ways that you can partner? Yeah. I mean, with Instagram, it makes everybody readily available to be reached. Um, You can just DM somebody, DM a business and try to get the ball rolling there. In the early stages, we were picking up phone calls and being and offering cross promotions to local businesses uh, doing email blasts and seeing if they could blast out our business on their uh, newsletter and we'll do the same. So just creating that value for other businesses and, and bringing it back to them. Do you have advice on how to pitch your business to other businesses to work together? As a business owner, you're looking for value, right? Value is the most important thing for a business. And if somebody can provide you value and you can give value in return, I think that's a win-win situation. 
So when I'm calling a business, I'm not looking to make money off of them. I'm, ca I'm calling to make money with them. So if there's a way where we can work together. And for example, if I have, if I call a gym, my cryo business is in the fitness industry. That's a good synergy for, for both businesses. So finding that area where you can both work well together and creating that synergy is really important for marketing. Brilliant. Do you do that with all your businesses? I know they're all slightly different. So I guess you have to find ways to partner because cryo, I mean, that's a unique comparison with the gym. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it, it, it's going, going back to what I said, mentioned about the blueprint. So for cryo, it might be a gym membership getting a discount at cryo. For the daycare, it's maybe it's somebody who works at a certain employer. They get 5 or 10% off their tuition. So it's a matter of keeping that same structure where we're trying to find people who already are a part of our business to incentivize others to come in. I mean, everything I, that happened was a learning lesson. Um, I definitely enjoyed every part of the experience of being an entrepreneur, the highs and the lows. Uh, but I think having a, really trying to be active and trying to find a mentor, somebody to help guide would have been oh, yes. along the way. Just because it'll help with the learning curve, so you're not. Do you have a mentor? I do not. I still do not. So it, early on, well, in the your mentor is Google. I think that's pretty much it. Google, <laughs> bunch of YouTubers teaching me different things, but I can't. Exp I can um, express the value of having somebody to kind of guide you in the beginning, just to get you started to just help get things along. What are you still actively learning about? Um, I mean, what, what am I not? I feel like I just have a thirst for knowledge. Uh, it's funny because when I was in high school um, and college, I really wasn't big into education. I was kind of like everybody else, just trying to get the certificate, trying to get the degree, uh, just trying to be done with it. But then once I got into grad school, got a little older, got a little more mature, I actually valued knowledge. I love learning in the classroom. I love learning on YouTube. I love hearing about people and their experiences through podcasts. So I'm, I'm constantly trying to be better, to hone my skills in for entrepreneurship and learn more about things that could help me in the future as well. So, I mean, like even with the lockdown now because of COVID-19, uh, we've had a lot of downtime to just be at home, especially with our loved ones and family. So I've been spending time daily on YouTube and just scouring the internet for different things that can help me grow Wow. Well, is there one piece of advice you would give to entrepreneurs that are looking to start a business? I think entrepreneurship is definitely needed. It's um, not a, maybe not as a side, maybe not as a full-time job, maybe not uh, as something that you want to commit to, maybe just a little side hustle to bring in more income. I think nowadays I see uh, people always struggling over financial issues and having one income, I think, in today's society is, is tough. So I think if you're looking to kind of be more uh, financially independent, it's important to have a side hustle and go into uh, entrepreneurship because that's a way you can generate money for yourself, for your loved ones, and, and just be a little more financially independent. Yeah, so I can't stress enough. I really don't think I'm any special than maybe anybody who might be watching this video. It's literally all in front of you in today's talk. Uh, Society with the internet just real readily available right on our phones. We're on it 24 7 Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Even as you're scrolling through feeds, there's educational accounts, there's businesses that you can learn from, there's videos out there. So just get started. I literally started from the ground up just on Google, just on YouTube, learning as much as I can and putting in and taking the jump, taking the leap of faith to really put it into work. And that's kind of how I've gotten here today. And I think most people can, if they can just have the courage to do so and be willing to learn. I love that. And that's true. Have the courage to just try it because you never know. I mean, you started from nothing. I started my business from nothing. And now we both own successful businesses. So if we can do it, you can do it. Just try it. Absolutely. Well, it's been amazing having you on the show, Jeff. Thank you so much for joining us. And thanks to everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you want to learn more about Jeff, CryoCentral, and SoulFresh, visit CryoCentral.com, SoulFreshJC.com, and you can follow Jeff on Instagram at Jeff.Eskio. That's all for this episode of School of Hustle. Keep up with our other episodes on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you download and stream podcasts. And if you like this show, please leave a review. It really helps and share with your friends. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye.